Okay, so today uh, the, the goal is to finish up um, what we didn't talk about with blood in the last lecture. So we wanna talk more about white blood cells today. And we want to take a, a little break after that. And I'm gonna give you an assignment to do on your own on the labs, just kind of like we, what we did last week with the uh, blood typing lab. But this week it's gonna deal with white blood cells. Then we're gonna come back from that break slash assignment and we will discuss the heart, uh, the structure and anatomy and physiology of the heart and the blood flow through the heart. And that will be what we end up with today. And then next week we'll, we'll do um, the blood vessels. So the veins and arteries and we'll talk about the lymphatic system a little bit as well. All right, so let's jump right into it. And let me share my screen with you. And we'll get started. <clears throat> okay, so it's the same PowerPoint from last week. Um, we're just going to continue with it. There is lots of stuff on here that I'm not going to require. You understand how I usually work. There's lots of stuff in here about diseases that I'm not going to hold you responsible for. Um, most it's going to be the anatomy and physiology parts, not necessarily the disease portions. Okay, so just to kind of recap from last week, a very little bit, we talked about the blood has these things called formed elements in them. And these formed elements are going to be about 50% or 55% of your <clears throat> total blood volume um, with the plasma, plasma being your liquid portion of the blood. The formed elements are going to be the solid portions of the blood. So we have three basic formed elements. We have these red blood cells. Which are, called, which are called erythrocytes, okay? The term erythro means red and site means cell. Anytime you see the word site, that's gonna mean cell. So erythrocyte, osteocyte, hepatocyte, leukocyte, okay? Any one of those, anytime you see a site, it means cell. And then we have our white blood cells, okay? Which are called leukocytes or lymphocytes. And we're gonna talk about those um, today. Okay. Just to give you an idea of how many of these formed elements are found in your blood. Okay. We have around 4.2 to 6.2 million, um, red blood cells per micrometer of blood. We have 5,000 to 10,000 white blood cells and platelets. We have 140,000 to 340,000 in our blood. This is in a, a normal average blood sample of a healthy human being. If the person is not healthy, if that person has some type of genetic disease or blood disease, these numbers can vary. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. There can be reasons where a person's blood, a red blood cell level is too high or too low. Um, there could be reasons why people's white blood cell levels could be too high or too low. Specifically, if they're too low, they're going to have some type of infection that's killing their white blood cells. If they're too high, they have um, they probably have an infection that's causing more blood cells to be formed. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And platelets, again, some people can have more or less than these, depending on their current situation. OK, so the formation of these cells comes from various different places. OK, uh, your red blood cells are going to come from your bone marrow, which we call myeloid tissue. Okay, all of your red blood cells come from your myeloid tissue. Your white blood cells are going to mainly be produced in what we call lymphoid tissue. You've probably heard the term lymph or lymph node. Okay, lymph nodes are part of your lymphatic system, which we call the lymphoid tissue. And most of your white blood cells are going to come from there. And, and what is lymphoid tissue? It could be... <clears throat> lymph nodes, like I said, and lymph nodes are, are these big bundles of lymph tissue that you find in different areas of the body. So when you go to like a, when you go get a physical at a doctor's office, they, they go feeling around for lymph nodes to make sure that those lymph nodes aren't inflamed. They want to make sure those lymph nodes aren't, um, you know, have any irregularities to them. Okay. That might indicate a tumor or something like that. And they're going to press around certain portions of your body. 
Um, your, your throat is going to be one area that they press around to make sure that there's no abnormalities. Um, your abdomen, your lower abdomen, behind your knees, you have lymph tissue under your arms and your armpit area. You have lymph tissue in your breasts. You have lymph tissue. Okay, all these areas are areas that doctors are going to make sure that they check thoroughly for any type of abnormality during a, a physical or anything like that. Uh, your thymus is a gland that's going to help produce uh, white blood cells and your spleen is also going to be one of those organs that's going to help produce white blood cells, especially B cells. And you can live without a spleen. Okay. People do rupture spleens and get them removed, but you're just understand that, you know, if you don't have a spleen, that means you're not making white blood cells from that spleen, which means that your immune system is going to be slightly weakened. Okay. Happens to football players a lot. Okay. When you, when you get hit really hard, okay. Sometimes that could rupture a spleen. I know that happened to a quarterback many years back on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but I think he was on the Bucks, but I don't know. Okay. So uh, most blood diseases, I'm not going to get into individual diseases necessarily, um, but most blood diseases result from a failure of those tissues. Um, and that those failures of those tissues, right? So the myeloid or the lymphoid tissues fail to, to produce correct um, blood cells. Uh, the reason for that could be many different things. Could be uh, toxic chemicals, which could be, you know, exposure to toxic chemicals, could be um, exposure to radiation, okay? Things like actually radiation therapy for cancer. It could be radiation from the sunlight, things like that. Uh, could be inherited defects, so it could be a genetic thing that you inherited from your um, the, the, um, parents or grandparents. It could be because your diet isn't correct. Okay, this doesn't typically, you know, nutritional deficiencies isn't usually a problem with with uh, blood diseases in the United States because a lot of you know most people in the United States don't have nutritional deficiencies, but in other countries that you know don't have proper food sources or water sources, could definitely. Uh, have an increase in blood diseases due to nutritional deficiencies. Okay, cancers, okay, things like leukemia and lymphoma, things like that, those things could cause in a failure of your myeloid and lymphatic tissue, okay? <clears throat> okay, so some things that they can do to kind of diagnose or combat blood diseases, okay? One thing is called an ABC or an aspiration biopsy cytology. And basically what this does is it allows them to examine your blood forming tissues. Uh, so they'll, they'll go into your myeloid tissue and they'll take out um, some cells or take out some tissue from there. And that's what a biopsy is, right? A biopsy is a taking a sample of tissue. So if you, if you ever have a tumor that's found or someone uh, has a tumor that a doctor wants to diagnose to make sure it's you know either malignant or benign, they will get a biopsy, which means they'll go out and take a piece of that tumor. So if they wanna check your myeloid tissue or your lymphoid tissue, they'll actually go in and take a biopsy. Uh, and then they can look at that biopsy under a microscope and do some various tests on it to see uh, what the problem is. Um, bone marrow and cord blood and hemopoietic stem cell transplants <clears throat> That, excuse me, is a type of treatment for people that have um, blood diseases. Okay, so stem cells, there are two types of stem cells. There are fetal stem cells and there are adult stem cells. And both of which, what makes a stem cell special is that it hasn't become differentiated yet. And the term differentiated means it hasn't um, decided like what kind of cell it's going to become. So it's a cell that all your stem cells are cells that are going to become other things, right? So a stem cell could become part of your circulatory system, or it could become part of your um, skeletal system, or it could become part of your immune system, or it could become part of your nervous system. And it, it, it hasn't changed yet. And that's what the word differentiate means. So a stem cell is a cell that hasn't differentiated, hasn't become anything yet. So hypothetically, there shouldn't be any mistakes in your stem cells. There shouldn't be diseases. There shouldn't be anything like that in your stem cells because they haven't become anything yet. So what they do is they take stem cells from your bone marrow. They could take stem cells from cord blood, which is um, umbilical cord of a child. 
Um, <clears throat> and that's actually a lot safer than like fetals themselves that you would take from the actual fetus itself, obviously. Okay, um, a lot of people have options now where they can actually save the cord blood uh, from their child after the child is born and they can freeze the cord blood so that later on, if anything ever uh, happens to that child where that child needs um, stem cells from itself, they can go back into the freezer where they're, where they're keeping the, the stem cells for that child and they can take the, the stem cells from that cord blood and then administer them to that individual uh, for you know, whatever reason that they need it. Okay. And the idea is that those cells will replace the disease cells and that hopefully that they'll destroy the, the cells that are, that are the problem cells in the body. That's the hope. Okay. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. There are lots of studies that show varied results um, with both bone marrow transplants and cord blood transplants. Okay, uh, we wanted to talk about this, um, the ability of red blood cells to move around the body and get in and out of places. Um, so, you know, in biology, a lot of times we always really, uh, we, we focus on how shape and function always go together. Okay, and this is a great example of how shape and function work together in biology. Okay, we well, might have seen it if you've ever taken a, like a general biology course and you've seen uh, enzymes. Uh, they always talk about enzymes as like a lock and a key and how the shape of the key determines um, if it works in that particular shape of that lock. Okay, same kind of thing here with shape and function. Um, the red blood cells have this really flexible plasma membrane Okay, the, the, the membrane that goes around the outside of the cell is very, very flexible, very, very pliable. And it, it can deform very easily, which means that when you hear the word deform, you kind of think of like a, a negative um, connotation to that, deformation or things like that. Um, but it's actually a good thing because all it, all it means is that it's changing shape. It has the ability to be malleable in a sense. Okay, think of like... <clears throat> Think of like a piece of gum, right? You can move and, and manipulate a piece of gum into lots of different shapes. And you'd be able to fit gum. If you took gum, you'd be able to fit gum into like a hole in a wall or something like that. And you wouldn't have to tear the gum apart or anything like that. Red blood cells are very similar, okay? Their outer membranes are very, very um, flexible. And it allows them to pass through very small diameter capillaries, okay? So if you need blood cells, in a particular area, they're able to kind of manipulate their membranes so that they can get into really tight spaces. A good example, I mean, it might be a little gross, but if you've ever seen a mouse or a rat get into a really, really tight spot, that's kind of like what red blood cells can do, okay? Um, you can have this tiny little space between a door and a wall or a door on the floor, and a mouse can really like get himself under there or or you know, squeeze his body underneath that thing. And that's and then he comes out of the other end and he's perfectly fine, his body's fine, there's nothing wrong, he didn't break any bones or anything like that. Same thing with red blood cells. They can really um, cause their membrane to, to take shapes that they need to, to in order to get into small places. Um, red blood cells have this shape that we call biconcave. And I really wish I had some type of like pen instrument for this computer, but it just, I, I bought one and it doesn't seem to really work. So I'm gonna, tr I'll try and draw something here for you. Okay, but if you take a look at a red blood cell from the side view, not over the top, if you take a, red, a look at a blood cell from the top, it just looks like a circle, okay? But if you take a look at it from the side, right? So let me just grab a piece of paper. If this was a red blood cell, just think of it as a circle. If I look at it from the side like this, it doesn't look like an oval. You would think it would look like an oval, right? If, like if almost if you like looked at a donut from the side, okay? It doesn't look like that. It, it looks more like, looks more like a peanut, like that, okay? And this, this shape is called biconcave, okay? Which means two cavities, two 
areas where it's concave. Okay, so here is one concave surface and here is another concave surface. And it, that makes the center very thin and the edges very thick, okay? The reason that it's like this is because we need to hold oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? So think of it like kind of like a wagon where you, know, you can put oxygen here and you can put CO2 over here, okay? In those little dimples in the red blood cell. Now, the reason that it has these two biconcave or this, this biconcave nature is because of this third bullet here, the absence of a nucleus and cytoplasmic organelles. Okay, so a just like any cell in the body, it's going to start with a nucleus, right? If, if you remember mitosis and cell replication and cell division, you can't make new cells unless you have a nucleus, right? You have to start with one cell that has a nucleus, double its chromosomes, and then split those chromosomes in half to get two new cells. Well, <clears throat> red blood cells don't have nuclei, but they didn't always not have a nuclei. Their nuclei was removed from them when before they were released into the bloodstream. Okay, so a, a red blood cell actually starts off like this oval shape with a nucleus in the center, just like that. And then once this red blood, because it had to be made from another cell, right? There was a stem cell that had, uh, or you know, a, a cell before that that had to produce that cell through cell division, and it needed a nucleus to do that because it needs the gen it needs all the genes to be a red blood cell, right? There are characteristics of a red blood cell that it only gets from DNA. But before this cell gets put into the into the uh, bloodstream, okay, this nucleus here has to be removed. Okay, this nucleus has to be taken out, and what you're left with is this original, is this shape up here, which is this um, biconcave peanut looking shape. Okay, and when you remove that circle, it kind of collapses the center, right? Because that, that, that nucleus was kind of keeping the, the internal pressure of the cell so that it could be this nice round cell. But once you remove that center piece, there's nothing there to hold up the walls and it's gonna kind of collapse in the center and give us this biconcave nature, which allows us to hold hemoglobin and, and oxygen and CO2, okay? So that's, that's what, so the shape of this cell is gonna really, really help its function. Because if the, if the cell was round like this, if the cell didn't have, if the cell had the nucleus and it stayed round like this, there would be no place to hold hemoglobin. There would be no place to put carbon dioxide and oxygen. Okay, so it wouldn't function properly. It wouldn't function as a, as a red blood cell. Now, without a nucleus, we have some issues though. Okay, that, that does cause a problem. And the problem is that this cell, this red blood cell that has no nucleus, it can never divide. It can't ever become new blood cells, right? Because you need to have a nucleus because part of mitosis is the synthesis phase and the synthesis phase requires DNA to divide, uh, to replicate and copy itself and become uh, and make new DNA, right? So if you have 46 chromosomes, those 46 chromosomes have to be 92 and then you split them in half and you get new cells. But because there is no nucleus here, you can't go through cell division, okay? So what happens to these cells? Eventually, they can't stay there forever. They get thrown away, okay? Your body recycles them. And that happens about once every 120 days. So once every four months about your red blood cells that are that old, that are 120 days old are getting thrown away and your body has to replace those cells. Okay, your bones and your myeloid tissue have to replace all of those red blood cells. So today, what is it, January 30th, there are some red blood cells in your body, right? that are 120 days old. Not all of them are, okay? Some are gonna be 118 days old. Some of them are gonna be five days old. Some of them will be two months old. But the ones that are 120 days old today will be removed and recycled by the liver, okay? And then new cells will be produced by your bones to replace all the cells that were 120 days old today. And the same thing will happen tomorrow, 
right? Tomorrow, a whole another bunch of cells are going to be 120 days old and they'll be recycled and they'll be replaced in the next day and so on and so on and so on. Right. Okay, here's a picture of red blood cells. These are actual red blood cells. I think this is taken under like uh, some type of an electron microscope or something like that. And you can see in some of these cells, depending on how they are tilted, you can see the shadow in the center because that, that concave shape is going to cause these dimples on the top and the bottom. So it's gonna be really thin in the middle. It's not, it's not a hole, it's not a donut, right? There's no, it's not a solid hole going through. It's just a big dimple that forms on top and the bottom of each one of these cells. So you can see it here really well. You can kind of see it here, but the light is shining on this cell a little too much. But here you can see it really well, here you can see it really well, here, here, here. Okay. Let me just get that. Okay, so iron, folate, which is vitamin B, and vitamin B12 are the, the things that you really need to make sure that your red blood cells are manufactured properly. Uh, so if you don't have a lot of iron in your diet or a lot of B, um, vitamin B and B12 in your diet, you should you should might, might you know want to think about adding that to your diet because it's really good for your blood and your blood formation. And when you lack blood or when you are low on red blood cells, you feel tired a lot. Okay, um, and that's because you don't have these cells to carry around oxygen. That's what they do, right? They carry oxygen around, and if you don't have the cells that carry oxygen around then you're not, you're not getting the oxygen that you need. So you're gonna feel tired, okay? If you don't have enough oxygen, that means you're not producing enough energy through cellular respiration because that's what the oxygen is used for. Um, so you might wanna make sure you get those in your diet. It's really easy to get those things in your diet because they're in a lot of grains, okay? If you take a look at uh, cereal, okay? I just had a bowl of cornflakes, you know, that's strictly just wheat uh, and corn, okay? so. There's lots of iron in there. There's lots of B vitamins in there. And you can take, if you don't like certain foods that have that stuff in it, you can always take supplements. Okay, but it's always best to get it from the actual foods. Okay, we can name our urethrocytes by their size. Okay, and this, this might be the worst name ever given in scientific history, normocytes. Okay, a normocyte is a normal sized red blood cell, which is about seven to nine micrometers in diameter. <clears throat> A microcyte is a small sized red blood cell and a macrocyte or macrocytic site, uh, cell is a larger sized red blood cell. And we can also name our blood cells according to how much hemoglobin they have. Okay, normochromic, which is going to be the normal amount of hemoglobin, which is, and again, that hemoglobin is gonna be responsible for carrying our oxygen around our body. Without hemoglobin, we don't carry our oxygen around. Hypochromic, which is low um, hemoglobin content. That word hypo means lower than normal or less than, okay? So the, you might hear that term with like hypoglycemia, okay? Hypoglycemia is the, you know, type one diabetes where people cannot produce enough insulin. Okay, and then you have hyper, which is the opposite of hypo, right? Hypochrome, hyperchromic, which means you have high amounts of hemoglobin, okay? We can take, uh, we can see a picture here of examples of these two things, the hyper or the normal chromic versus the normocyte. Okay, so in the middle here, we have normocytes. This is, this is a typical red blood cell. Don't look at the purple ones for now. The purple ones are white blood cells. So don't look at those right now. Look at just the, the pink ones and the whitish ones. Okay, so here's our normocyte, which is our normal sized red blood cell. Maybe take a look here. These are microcytes, which, which they're slightly smaller than our normocyte, but they are definitely smaller. Okay, here, here, these are all red blood cells that are a little bit smaller than normal. And on this side, we have our macrocytes, which are slightly bigger than our normocytes. Here's one, here's one. Okay, these are slightly bigger. And here are our um, normal hemoglobin content red blood cells, 
Okay, you can see the color is mostly red, maybe a slight white in the middle. Now, the reason the white is in the middle is not a hole, okay? Like, see, if we take a look at this cell, this, this white circle in the middle is not a hole. That's just the light passing through the cell, right? And remember, the middle of that cell is a lot thinner than the edges of the cell because the nucleus was removed and the, the center is closer to one another, right? So the top part of the membrane in the middle and the bottom part of the membrane in the middle are very close to one another. On the sides, there, those you know, membranes on top and bottom are very spaced apart because they have lots of you know, cytoplasm in there. But in the middle, they, sh they shrink down because the nucleus was taken out. So the light is passing through them easier than it's passing through the edges, okay? So it's not a hole, it's just the light is passing, the light from the microscope is passing through these in the center. But if you have a normal amount of uh, hemoglobin, that circle should be, you know, fairly, fairly small, maybe only about a third of the size in the center. If you have um, a high normal <clears throat> of hemoglobin, you can see the cells almost turn purple. Okay, there's, there's so much hemoglobin that they almost turn purple. And here are the other normal red blood cells. And over here, you get the opposite, right? If you have hypochromatic syndrome, or if you have little amounts of hemoglobin, you have large white circles in the middle because you're lacking the hemoglobin in the, in the center to, to give you that coloring. Okay. So what do erythrocytes do? They transport respiratory gases, they transport O2 and CO2. Okay. When you combine those with hemoglobin, you have oxyhemoglobin and carb carbamino hemoglobin. Okay. And that's, that's needed, right? You need to have this hemoglobin here in order to carry this oxygen and to carry this carbon dioxide. Okay. Okay, when you go to a doctor and they take a blood test, okay, they look for a couple of things in that blood test. And one thing that they do is they do something called a complete blood cell count, which is called a CBC. That is a very, that is the number one test that, you know, they give for every uh, blood sample. And it's a battery of, of blood tests, which means it's a whole cycle or a whole sequence of blood tests to measure the amounts um, or the levels of the things in your blood, right? So this complete blood count is going to tell you your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelet counts, uh, all that stuff, okay? So that, that's going to be a whole series of tests that they give you. Um, and that's going to be like the number one thing that a doctor, like if you go to a doctor and they want to, you know, make sure that everything's right, the first thing they give you is a CBC test or a CBC battery. Okay, hematocrit, okay, the term hematocrit, is the percentage of whole blood cells that is RBCs, okay? So that it's the percentage of blood that is red blood cells, pretty much. Okay, how much of your formed elements is red blood cells, okay? And that's another thing that they test for in your battery of red blood cell tests, okay? All right, I don't wanna talk about red blood cell disorders, so I'm going to be skipping from slide 24 all the way to the erythrocytes. Okay, right to here. So from 24 to 40, okay, you don't have necessarily have to be studying those. Okay, so leukocytes. Okay, leukocytes are white blood cells and we can categorize our leukocytes by the presence or the absence of what we call granules, all right? If, if the cell has granules, we call it a granulocyte, okay? If the cell does not have granules, we call it an agranulocyte, okay? So presence, granulocytes, no presence of granules, agranulocytes. We said before that the normal range is gonna be between 5,000 and 10,000 per sample of blood. If you have something called leukopenia, leukopenia is an abnormally low level of white blood cells. 
which is going to be below 5,000. This does not occur very often, but one reason that it could occur is because of an HIV infection. Okay, so let me let me bring up um, a blank page so I can draw some stuff for you. Okay, so in the in the human body, we have a couple of different types of blood cells, and we're going to take a look at those more um, in depthly in a moment. But we have these things called T helper cells, and these T helper cells are going to be responsible for letting your letting your immune system know that there is an antigen present that's, that could possibly make you sick. Okay, so a T helper cell's job is to, is to alert the immune system. Okay, that's the job of the T helper cell. Okay, it, it helps to alert the immune system that something is wrong, that uh, there is something in the body that needs to be um, destroyed because it's going to make us sick. And then your immune system will respond to that T helper cell and try to fight the infection. Okay. So it alerts the immune system and uh, attempts to increase immune response. Okay. So that's what the T helper cell does. HIV infection human immunodeficiency virus, that's what that stands for, human immunodeficiency. I don't know how to spell deficiency, but that's okay. Deficiency virus. Okay, human immunodeficiency virus, what it does is it attacks the helper cells. Okay, so this virus is going to attack this cell. So if you attack this cell, then what are you doing? Okay, if you attack that cell, you are then going to decrease the alert, the alert system for the immune system, right? If you, if you destroy these cells with a virus, you are going to then decrease the, the alarm system, so to speak, for the immune system. And you're also going to decrease your immune response, right? Because this cell's job is to tell other cells to kill this thing, right? T helper cells job is to blow the whistle on viruses in the body. And if you don't have T helper cells, they can never blow the whistle. And if you don't blow the whistle, you don't know that you're even sick, okay? So what happens is that your immune cells, the number of immune cells decreases, right? That five to 10,000 number goes down and down and down gradually, gradually over time, over time, over time, right? If we, if we were to draw some type of chart, okay? And this is your normal red blood, uh, white blood cell count, HIV infection is gonna look like this, okay? You're gonna have this like 10,000 number here between five and 10,000 number here. And as this infection goes on, you're going to see your number drop and drop and drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And drop. Okay. And when it gets to a certain number, okay, and I believe that number is, is uh, less than 500. Okay. I believe the number is less than 500 um, white blood cells. That that condition that your body is in, that state that your body is in, is called AIDS, okay? AIDS and HIV are very different. HIV is a virus. It's an actual um, particle that gets you sick. AIDS is not an actual pathogen. It's not a, it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria, it's not a fungus, it's none of that. It's just the state of your body. That's what the S stands for, the S is syndrome acute immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay, that's what AIDS stands for. So it's just the state that your body is in. You hypothetically could get AIDS 
but not from HIV. Okay, you could there there could be other diseases that cause white blood cell counts to drop. Okay, and it wouldn't be HIV, but HIV is is the one that we associate with AIDS. Okay, but AIDS is not the actual um, infection. AIDS is the state of your body at the time um, due to, and, and like I said, AIDS in this case is due to HIV infection. That does not mean that that's the only way to get AIDS, but that's the one that we typically associate with AIDS. Okay, you could have autoimmune diseases that kill off your, your white blood cells, okay, and that could lead to, to AIDS. Okay, that could lead to acute immunodeficiency syndrome, okay? But typically HIV is the one that we talk about when we talk about AIDS. Okay, let's go back to, back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so your leukocytosis, which is the um, opposite of leukopenia. Okay, so leukopenia is that abnormally low white blood cell count. Leuco, uh, leukocytosis, okay, anytime you see um, this osis at the end, um, that typically means like inflamed or, or things like that, like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's like, that's itis, that's appendicitis, okay, uh, cytosis, leukocytosis is the abnormally high white blood cell count, so you're over 10,000 um, cells per unit, okay, now, that typically means that you have some type of bacterial infection. Okay, if a doctor sees an, an abnormally low white blood cell count, they tend to think maybe you have a certain type of um, issue, okay, killing your white blood cells, and that could be uh, HIV infection, and they will test you for HIV if they see an abnormally low white blood cell count. If they see an abnormally high white blood cell count, that typically means you have some type of infection. Um, either a bacterial infection, viral infection, that's not HIV, it would be another bacterial infection that, that causes something else. And it could also be um, a sign of cancer, okay? Now, why is that? You typically don't have these cells floating around in your bloodstream. And you can see that by the number um, compared to the number of white blood cells compared to the number of red blood cells, right? You have 6 million red blood cells compared to 5,000 white blood cells in a normal um, blood sample. The reason for that is you don't need them there. White blood cells jobs are to kill antigens, to kill things that are infectious to you, things that are making you sick, to kill bacteria, to kill viruses, to kill fungus, to kill whatever is there that shouldn't be there. You are for the most part very healthy human beings. So you don't need to have a lot of um, white blood cells floating around in your, in your bloodstream. Only when you have an infection, only when you have a high amount of things that are causing you to be sick, are you gonna see high amounts of white blood cells? It's kind of like, I, I always like to say, it's kind of like you know the armed forces. Okay, we have this giant army, we have this giant military presence uh, in our country, we don't see them. Okay, we very rarely see anybody, any military person, like active, you know, an active military um, presence in our streets or in our, our cities and things like that. Um, if we ever got invaded by someone or if we ever like um, had, you know, a foreign country, you know, try to take us over, I, you bet your butt you would see armies all over the place that are active, not just people walking around in their uniforms, you'd see active, you know, um, military presence. That's kind of like what your, your blood, um, your white blood cells in your immune system are like, right? We, we have this massive immune system that is ready and waiting whenever they're needed, right? In our, and they, they hang out in our lymphatic system, right? All these white blood cells and you know, B cells and T cells, they're all hanging out in our white, in our um, immune system waiting to be deployed if, if needed, right? But we're not gonna deploy them unless we need them. And that usually means there's some type of infection. And now with the cancer, what cancer is, and any type of, all types of cancer are the same, um, they're tumors. And a tumor is a, is a cell that can't stop dividing, right? It has nothing to do necessarily with um, white blood cells being deployed to fight an infection. These are 
cells that are normally in your blood that those one of those five to 10,000 normal cells that are there, but they have some type of genetic issue where they cannot stop going through uh, mitosis and they divide and they divide and they divide and they divide uncontrollably. And whenever you have cells that divide uncontrollably, you end up with a mass of cells, right? You go from one cell to two, to four, to eight, to 16, to 32, to 64, and so on and so forth. Eventually, if that happens over a long period of time, you end up getting a tumor, right? Which is a mass of cells. And that could happen in any tissue. That can happen in your blood. That can happen in your brain. That could happen in your pancreas. It can happen in your lungs, your bones. All these different places can get, um, can, can get tumors. So if you see a lot of white blood cells in your blood, okay, a doctor will do further tests to see is the reason that there are a lot of white blood cells in your, in your bloodstream due to a bacterial infection? Like, do you have a fever? Do you have um, other symptoms? Do you have mucus production? Like, uh, you know, things like that. Do you have other type of symptoms that will indicate you have a, a bacterial infection? Because if you have like, if you go in and you have strep throat, right? And they give you a blood test, you're gonna have a really high white blood cell count. That doesn't mean you have cancer. That doesn't mean you have leukemia. Okay. You could be suffering from, you know, you might say, well, I can't even touch my throat. I can't swallow anything. I can't eat anything. And then the doctor will look at you and diagnose you and, and something like that. But if you go in and you don't have symptoms like that, okay. And you have a high white blood cell count, a doctor might want to do some more tests to see if, you know, the, the issue is, is more than just a bacterial infection. Okay. Here are the five types of white blood cells, okay? We have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. And we wanna talk about each one of these individually, okay? Um, you can see just by looking at them that they look very different from one another. Some of them, you can actually see the granules in them, okay? Remember we talked about granulocytes and agranulocytes. Um, some of them have large single nuclei. Some of them have, you know, two nuclei. Some of them have multiple nuclei. Okay, and they're all gonna have various functions. Okay, they're all gonna do different things and we are gonna talk about what they do now. Okay, so let's talk about the granulocytes first. Okay, so we're gonna talk about leukocytes that are, that have granules in them, okay? So they have granules present. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. These top three, this top three triangle here. These are my granulocytes, okay? Right there. And they vary in shape and size, but they all have these granules present, okay? So let's take a look at what they do individually. The neutrophils are the most numerous type of what we call a phagocyte. And what a phagocyte is, okay, the term phagocytosis, okay, the word term phagocytosis means to engulf. Okay, it means to engulf. And what that means is that these cells will actually kind of swallow things called antigens, things like bacterial cells, viral particles, stuff like that. So if I can just, I'm gonna try to draw. Okay, so here's a phagocyte. Now lots of different white blood cells are phagocytes. So I'm just gonna cover this as like a blanket statement. Okay, so here's a phagocyte. And we'll say here is a bacterial cell, okay? This cell here will actually engulf this tiny little cell here, okay? So let me try and draw this for you. Actually, you know what? I can probably just do it better if I was just getting a thing on YouTube. Hold on a sec. YouTube. Let's see if I can. Just grab something off YouTube for you. Endocytosis. Something. Okay. 
I like this video. This video is... Cells can move large particles okay. across the membrane by bulk transport. Okay, hold on one sec. Bulk skip, transport. Skip to the end. During endocytosis. Okay, so here's endocytosis. The cell Let me mute her for a second. So we have these things on the outside. These things, this is, this is a type of phagocytosis, okay? So let's say, actually, you know what? I think they have it at the end. Hold on. Here it is. Okay, hold on. Okay. So here are some bacteria. Okay, let me enlarge this. Okay, here we have some bacterial cells. Here is my phagocyte. Here is my white blood cell that its job is to do something called phagocytosis or engulf these bacterial particles. Let's see, I have people in the chat trying to talk to me. Hold on. Okay, I'll, I'll get to your questions in a moment, I promise. Oops. Okay, so let me show this video first. Okay, so here we have our antigens, our bacteria, our viral particles, whatever these things are. This job, this cell's job is to take these things in and destroy them. Okay, so what we're going to see is the membrane, okay, of our phagocyte actually deform itself and surround these bacterial particles with its own membrane. And eventually it will pinch off like that. And now these bacteria that were on the outside of the cell are now on the inside of the cell. Okay, this here, this little bubble that it made to surround these intruders is called a vacuole or a vesicle. Okay, it's a vesicle, not a vacuole. I apologize. Let me write that down here and say vesicle. Okay, and this little vesicle now is like a little transport bubble for these little antigens. Now, what the cell is going to do the cell is going to call on other organelles to help destroy these bacteria or these viruses, whatever these particles are. This could be pollen, okay? It's something that shouldn't be inside of your body. That, that's what it comes down to. And we wanna break these things down into a tiny, tiny, we wanna chop them up, right? We wanna destroy them, we wanna chop them up into tiny little pieces. So we call on these things called lysosomes and they're gonna show up in a moment. There it is, okay? This is a lysosome. Okay, we, we might have discussed that or you might have discussed that in another class like uh, cellular biology, okay, when you learned about all the different organelles. And this lysosome, its job, it's like the garbage man of the cell. Basically what this um, lysosome does is it destroys things that shouldn't be there. It could be waste products, uh, it could be bacterial cells, viral particles, antigens, things like that. But what's inside of this lysosome are things called hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolytic enzymes. And these hydrolytic enzymes, their job is to break stuff down. It's very, very acidic, right? Uh, the pH is very, very low. And these uh, hydrolytic enzymes are going to kill all of these things, right? So we're going to see when I hit play, we're going to see this lysosome merge with this vesicle because they're made of the same stuff, right? The, the membrane here, this this vesicle wall is the same, or this lysosome wall is made of the same stuff that this vesicle wall is made of. So they can kind of just merge together, kind of like if you had Play-Doh in two hands and you squish it together, you have one larger piece of Play-Doh. That's kind of what's gonna happen here, right? So this lysosome is gonna merge with the vesicle and all of the enzymes that are inside the lysosome are gonna pour into the vesicle and kill those bacterial cells, okay? so. Let me hit play. Okay, it merged with it. Now all of those enzymes that are inside, oh, come on, I hate this. Okay, all those enzymes that are inside are going to destroy our little bacteria, just like that. Okay, so that's phagocytosis. Okay, so a neutrophil is the most numerous type of phagocyte, right? There are, there are other phagocytes and we're gonna take a look at the other phagocytes, but the neutrophil is the one that we see the most often. And again, its numbers are gonna increase 
when you have bacterial infections. Okay, so let me go back to the chat real quick because I know people had some questions in the chat. Can you increase your T helper cells with medication or other treatments? Uh, there might be medicines that can help increase your T helper cells. I'm not sure what the new medicines do for HIV. Okay, the, the first types of medicines for HIV try to attack the virus and try to attack a specific enzyme that stop the virus from replicating, right? There's, um, there are types of viruses called reverse transcriptase viruses and HIV is a type of reverse transcriptase virus, which means it, it copies its DNA backwards in a sense. Uh, it goes from message to DNA instead of from DNA to message. Uh, so it, it's a little tricky to deal with when you have an, something called an RNA virus like HIV. So there's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that helps it to divide, it helps it to replicate. So the early drugs try to attack that enzyme because if you attack the enzyme, then it can't replicate and then you should have a decrease in HIV, but then it, then it um, mutated, right? The, the virus mutated and made that medication kind of useless or not, not nearly as good. Um, I'm not sure what the new medications do to help with T helper cells. I can look that up for you during the break. And then our second question is, does radiation stop the cancer cells from dividing in theory? Yes. So what radiation does, radiation therapy, there are two types of therapies for cancer. There's chemotherapy and there's radiation therapy. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy both do the same thing. They look for cells that are dividing and it kills the cells from the, that are dividing. It doesn't stop them from dividing. It kills the dividing cells. Okay, that's, that's, there's a difference there, right? It's not just gonna take a cell and stop it from dividing. If it sees a dividing cell, it kills it. Now, the problem with chemo and radiation is that it doesn't, it doesn't know how to distinguish between a healthy cell that's dividing normally and a cancer cell that's dividing cancerously. So it just kills them all. It doesn't, it doesn't ask any questions. It just kills all the cells that are dividing. And that's why people have um, hair loss. That's why people get rashes on their skin that's why people's digestive systems uh, bother them when they're on chemo and radiation, because the cells that the cells that line your mouth, line your digestive tract, hair follicles, these are cells that are rapidly dividing normally all the time, right? There are certain cells in your body that are constantly just dividing all the time anyway, in a very normal way, because of friction, right? When in in your mouth, in your uh, trachea, esophagus, and your stomach and your intestines, there's constant friction all the time because things are moving, food is moving, your stomach is grinding all the time. And when you have friction, you lose cells, right? That's why your, your skin, the out, uh, outer epidermis is always losing cells because of friction. So anywhere where you have lots of friction like that, you're gonna have rapidly dividing cells and the radiation, the chemo don't know that it shouldn't be killing the cells of your digestive system if you have a brain tumor, right? It just knows that these cells are dividing really rapidly and it's gonna kill them. Um, so that's why people have these side effects. Now, the difference between chemo and radiation is that chemo affects, a chemo is given to you as like a hole in your entire body, right? So chemo is like usually put into a bag or a needle and it's injected into your blood and it, it goes throughout your entire body. Uh, so the chemo really has, effects on multiple parts of you, right? Because it's, it's flowing through every portion of your circulatory system. Radiation is different in the sense that it's localized, right? Radiation can be in the form of like beams and they'll shoot the actual tumor, right? So instead, like if you have, um, if you have lung cancer, chemo will flow out, will flow through your whole body, not just your lung, right? So, you know, there's going to be chemo in your hand. There's going to be, you know, that medicine, that chemo, that's what chemo stands for, chemical therapy, right? So that medicine is going to be in your arms and your legs and your head and your abdomen, even though your tumor is localized in the lung, it's going everywhere, right? Radiation is going to be localized. It's not going to be injected into your blood. It's going to be shot onto a tumor in your lung. Um, it could be like, like I said, in a beam. So the beam would be, would radiate onto the tumor. It could be in the form of beads, 
where they take these little like plastic beads and they soak them with radiation and they implant the beads onto the tumor. Okay, but it's very, it's very specific in where it goes. Okay, so that's the difference between radiation and chemo. And oh, the other question was what other diseases in your body can cause state of AIDS? I'll check that out. Uh, it's probably some type of autoimmune disease where it's your, your own body killing off your, your own white blood cells, but I'll, I'll check those out for you during the break. Let me just write that down, okay. <clears throat> okay. Eosinophils, so we talked about neutrophils. Eosinophils, these are another type of phagocyte, okay? They do the same thing that we just saw. They engulf those cells, but they're not going to be as active and as numerous as neutrophils. We see eosinophils more when dealing with parasites or parasitic worms, like tapeworm, um, and they're also involved in allergic reactions. Okay, so when, like I said before, that intruder doesn't necessarily have to be a virus or a um, bacteria. It could be a, a pathogen or an antigen, specifically an antigen, is something that shouldn't be in your body, right? It doesn't belong to you. And your body knows what belongs to you and what does not belong to you. A piece of pollen or a piece of shellfish, right? Because you can have allergic reactions to lots of different things. Those are things that your body, in some people, genetically, will, your immune system will have a reaction to, right? Some people are allergic to pollen. I am very allergic to pollen. I'm very allergic to ragweed and dust and all those other types of things. My genetics say that my immune system is going to react to those things in a different way than people that don't have allergies to them. Same thing with shellfish allergies or peanut allergies, something like that. And these eosinophils are going to help to reduce those allergic reactions by uh, doing phagocytosis to whatever it is that's causing the allergic reaction. Could be pollen, things like that. Okay. Basophils, the last type of granulocyte. Okay. Uh, these deal with uh, the secretion of histamines. Okay. Histamines are going to cause inflammation. Okay. And you take you most likely have taken antihistamines, okay? If you've ever taken some type of allergy medicine like, um, like Benadryl, okay, or things like that, those are things like antihistamines, okay? And antihistamines are gonna reduce inflammation, okay? Basophils increase inflammation. And the reason you want an increase of inflammation is it's going to cause an immune response, right? Inflammation is going to call for other immune cells to come to the area to help fight this infection. Okay. So you might think of, wow, that, why would, why would my body want to produce inflammation? Okay. But you do, you, you have, like you wake up one day and you, you have an inflamed lymph node in your throat because you have strep throat. Those are cells calling for help from other cells basically. Okay. They also secrete um, a chemical called heparin, which is an anticoagulant. Okay. Heparin uh, is, we can actually give heparin to patients uh, so that their blood does not clot, right? There are sometimes we don't want blood to clot in patients uh, and we can give them heparin, but basophils are also gonna secrete heparin as well, okay, as an anticoagulant. Why, why do you want that? You want, a, you want thinner blood in order, what thinner blood will do is it'll increase the chances of blood cells getting to that area, right? When you have thick blood, it's, it's like traffic, right? Think of, think of uh, cars. Um, think of like um, thin blood as a freeway with no traffic and thicker blood as a freeway with traffic, right? You don't want to have an ambulance stuck on a, on a thick or a, a high traffic roadway. You want an ambulance with a patient to go on a, onto a road that has no cars on it, right? And the same principles here, right? If you, give, if you give a patient heparin or if a basophil secretes heparin, you're kind of thinning out the blood so that you can decrease the traffic in the circulatory system. Okay. Next up, we're going to talk about the agranulocytes or the ones that do not have granules. Okay. Monocytes are one of those. And B cells or B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes are also agranulocytes. So a monocyte, let's talk about monocytes. I'm going to go back to drawing my picture. 
monocytes are actually the largest of all of these cells in size. Okay, the size of these are very, very big. And a monocyte has a very large nucleus in the center. Okay, if we go back up to my picture, let's see if I can go back to the PowerPoint. Oops, that's not it. If I go back up to my picture in the PowerPoint, we can see our monocyte has a, an extremely large nucleus. Okay, this has, that's how you can tell a monocyte from any other cell. It has one giant nucleus in the center. Okay. And these monocytes have the ability to be something called an APC, which stands for antigen presenting cell. Okay. And what that means is that, and I'm not going to draw it all over again, but um, it's a phagocyte. So it can take a bacterial cell in and destroy it. So I'm just going to draw like what we have. So here, here's the vesicle that it took in. Here are all the little parts of the bacteria that it broke down, right? So these little bacterial cells are all broken into small little tiny pieces. Okay. And now instead of just like a new, what a neutrophil would do is once a neutrophil kills all, the, all those bacterial cells and it breaks them all up into little pieces, it'll just get rid of those pieces and get on with it with its day, okay? A uh, monocyte takes it another step further, okay? It, it, it doesn't wanna just go in, do its job and go home, okay? It wants to do something a little bit extra. So it's not only gonna do this, but it's gonna act as an antigen presenting cell, which means that what this is gonna do, what this monocyte's gonna do, this monocyte is going to take these little pieces and it's going to put these little pieces on the surface of itself and present them to the other immune cells. See, like a neutrophil, it, it finds a bad guy, it takes, it takes the bad guy out, and then it doesn't really tell anybody that it did it, right? It just goes there, it finds the bad guy, it handles the bad guy, and it goes and finds another bad guy. Right, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, right? Because neutrophils are finding the bad guys. We don't want the bad guys. But a monocyte is going to find the bad guy. It's going to rip its arms off. And then it's going to show everybody the arms, which is kind of weird. <laughs> My analogy is kind of sick. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say. All right. So it'll take parts of that thing that it just killed and it'll present those parts to the other immune cells. And it'll say, hey, other immune cells, if you see these things floating around the body, make sure you kill these things because these things are gonna make, these things are trying to make us sick. Okay, I'm not gonna go around the whole cell, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's taking these little parts, like back in the thousands of years ago, like barbarian armies used to kill their opponents and then take their heads, put them on spikes and put them outside the castle and say, you mess with us, this is what happens, right? This is kind of what the monocyte's doing. The monocyte's taking those bacterial cells, breaking them up into small parts, putting them on spikes, putting them outside and saying, hey, everybody, look for these things because if you find these things, well, you have to kill them, okay? And it's going to elicit immune responses from other things, right? So just to go back to the PowerPoint really quick without me erasing this, the other... Um, a granulocyte that I talk about are B cells and T cells. So let's go back to that real quick. Go back to my drawing. So how do B cells and T cells interact with this stuff, right? So here's a B cell. We're going to draw a B cell. We'll color it a little different so that you know it's a B cell. Okay, here's a B cell. B cell is much smaller than a monocyte. B cell's job is to make antibodies, okay? So this is a B cell. And a B cell produces antibodies, okay? This B cell can only produce antibodies if it's 
presented with an antigen like this. So this antigen is going to be seen by this B cell. Okay, so let me draw some type of little thing here. Okay, so this B cell is going to see this antigen and it's gonna produce antibodies. Antibodies look like little Ys. So I'm just gonna draw a little Y. Okay, that's what, a, that's what an antibody looks like. Okay, if I was to draw it, I would just draw a Y. Okay, I might draw it in different um, orientations, but it's still a Y. So now this body, uh, this B cell produces this antibody and this antibody is specific for this antigen, right? So this, let's say, you know, if this was COVID, if this was COVID, this antibody here would be specific for COVID. If this was HIV and you, and, you know, this B cell would, well, let's, let's not use HIV. Let's say this was, um, I don't know, chickenpox, smallpox, whatever. This antibody would be used specifically for smallpox. Your B cells have the ability to make millions and millions of different types of antibodies. So they can make antibodies for specific antigens so that if you ever get infected with that antigen again, your body can immediately try to kill it. That's what that's basically what a vaccine does, right? You're given a vaccine. Uh, a vaccine um, is basically a fake infection, if you want to think of it like that, right? You're, you're trying to trick your body into thinking you're infected so that you can cause this to happen, right? So you're given a, you know, a vaccine which has parts of a virus in it, but it doesn't have the parts that make you sick. This whole process occurs and your B cells will make antigens for that vaccination. So that anytime, like, you know, let's say uh, you're taking a measles vaccine, your body is given measles, but an, a, a, um, a type of measles that's not infectious, right? It doesn't make you sick. So it's like the shell of measles. And then, but your B cells don't know that. Your B cells thinks it's, it's real measles. So it makes antibodies for the measles thinking it's a real infection. So that if you are ever infected with measles, your B cells go, I remember that. And it makes the actual antigen for the measles specifically, right? And every time you, you get infected with anything, if you get infected with um, any type of disease, your body is hopefully going to make antibodies against that particular uh, antigen. Okay, so that's what monocytes do. They present, they uh, present antigens on their surface. Okay, so let me clear that. Go back to this. Okay, T cells. T cells are a little bit different. We talked about T helper cells, and T helper cells uh, do a certain thing. And there are there are two types of T cells. So let me let me write this. So we have T. Oops. We have T helper. We have something called cytotoxic T cells. Okay, so T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells. Okay, I said before that T helper cells are like whistleblowers. They see a, an antigen and they produce a label for the antigen. Okay, so let's say, let's say here's a, an antigen, all right? This is, this is something that can make you sick. A T helper cell kind of blows the whistle on this by producing little tiny like proteins and they stick these little proteins on the surface of the antigen just like that. Okay, that's all a T cell does. Now, why would a T cell do that? Now, if I was in class, if I was in the classroom, I, I like to, one thing that I like to do with this is I like to get post-it notes and I go around the room and I pick one student to be the antigen, right? And the antigen is something that's not supposed to be there, right? So your cells know what cells are not supposed to be there. And that's the T cell's job. T cell's job is to float around the immune system, float around the circulatory system, and find something that's not supposed to be there. And when it finds something, it puts a label on it. And that this little purple dot or pink dot is the label. So what I do in class is I walk around the room and I pick one kid 
and I slap a post-it note on its back and that post-it note says antigen. I didn't do anything except tell everybody else what's not supposed to be there. I didn't take that kid out of the room. I didn't, um, I didn't try to destroy that antigen at all or anything. I just said, here's the thing that shouldn't be here. Someone else, please take care of this. This thing's not supposed to be here. I'm blowing the whistle. I'm, I'm being a tattletale, right? This person's not supposed to be here, okay? Cytotoxic T cells. Okay, let me draw a cytotoxic T cell for you. Let's do a different color. Let's do, uh, let's do orange this time. Okay, here's my cytotoxic T cell. And its job is to look for labeled antigens. Okay, AG means antigens. So this cytotoxic T cell is floating around the body looking for that. And once it finds that, it can then destroy it. It can then kill it. So my, I, I call my T helper cells the whistleblowers or the tattletales, and I call the cytotoxic T cells the muscle, right? They're the cells that actually take out the, the antigens that have been labeled, okay? So that's the difference between the two different types of T cells. Okay, so again, monocytes, large, the largest ones out of all of them, very, very aggressive uh, phagocyte. Okay, B cells involved in immunity against disease, they secrete antibodies, like I just said. Okay, we can call mature B cells, plasma cells. There is a autoimmune disease that can kill your B cells. Okay, um, it's called mononucleosis, I think. Okay, T lymphocytes are involved in, a, in the direct attack on bacteria or cancer cells. Okay, just like I said before, they look for these labels and they kill those, they kill anything that's labeled. Okay, and we don't wanna get into the disorders just yet. So what we're gonna do is, that's it for red and white blood cells. What we're gonna do now is I'm going to, okay, so welcome back. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to <clears throat> talk about the structure of the heart and we also want to talk about blood flow through the heart and then I'll give you some questions to do that you can either start now or start when, we, when we're done and get them done today or you can, um, I'll give you, I'll give you till next week to finish those questions up. Uh, let's see. What I want to do is I want to get a picture of the heart. That's the best way for me to to teach this, in my opinion. Okay, rather than on a PowerPoint or something like that. So find one for me for you. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. share my screen. All right, so here is the human heart. The human heart is a four chambered heart. Let me get my all annotations here. Okay, so we have a four chambered heart in the human body. Two of those chambers are collecting chambers and we call those atria and two of those chambers are pumping chambers and we call those ventricles <clears throat> okay so we have four chambers Two are collecting chambers, two are pumping chambers. The collecting chambers are called atria, the pumping chambers are called ventricles. We also have four valves 
in the human heart. <clears throat> Few of those valves connect the atria to the ventricles. We call those atrioventricular valves. And two of those chain, uh, two of those valves exit the heart. We call those valves semilunar valves. So what we want to do, our goal in the next you know, hour or so, is to be able to identify the four chambers. We want to be able to identify the four valves. And we want to know how blood flows through this whole system. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the anatomy of this, of the chambers and the valves. Then we're going to talk about blood vessels that attach to the heart. Okay, blood vessels attached to the heart, which are going to be our aorta, our vena cava, our pulmonary veins, and our pulmonary arteries. And then the last thing that we're going to do is we'll talk about blood flow. And in blood flow through the heart, In blood flow through the heart, we have two uh, different flows because we talk about in, in relationship to the heart, we talk about the left side of the heart and we talk about the right side of the heart, okay? The left side of the heart, um, we call cardiac circulation. Okay, or so we can also call it systolic. We'll just call it cardiac. I like calling it cardiac circulation. Okay, cardiac circulation, and that deals with oxygenated blood. Okay, and that is on the left side. Okay, so this is the left side of the heart. Okay, left side of the heart is cardiac circulation for oxygenated blood. And on the right side of the heart, We call that pulmonary circulation. And that deals with deoxygenated blood. Okay. And then after that, we'll talk about blood pressure, which we have systolic and diastolic, so systolic blood pressure. And again, I'm gonna go through all this. I'm just laying it out. Okay, systolic blood pressure is the pressure of ventricles or the bottom of the heart. And we'll talk about diastolic pressure, which is the pressure of the atria. Relaxing. And that is going to be the top of the heart. Okay. So that's what we want to get done now. It's a lot of information. 
but we're going to get through it just fine. Okay. And also in blood vessels, we want to know, let's just, I don't know if I could edit that, but we want to talk about um, arteries and veins and the difference between them. Okay. All right. So let's get cracking. Let me get some of this stuff out of the way here. Okay. All right. So let's start with this stuff on the left-hand side here, our four chambers. That's going to be the first thing we need to, to talk about. Okay. So when you're looking at a model of a heart like this, you're looking at it in the anatomical position. So this is going to be the left side of the heart. And this will be the right side of the heart. Okay, so you're looking at it as if someone, if, as if this is in someone's body looking at you. Okay, so everything's kind of backwards here, but that's okay. All right, so atria, okay, in like old Latin or Greek, the term atria or atrium is a domed structure, right? So in like ancient Rome, they, or in ancient Greece, they had these, these buildings that had these big domed ceilings and they called them atriums. So the tops of our heart are going to be called, and see if I can write these in, in the appropriate colors. It is gonna be called the left atrium here. This is the left atrium and that's LA. And then we're gonna do, nope, we'll make that red because it's the left side. Remember the left side of the heart is oxygenated. So I'm gonna make it red, okay? Whenever you see oxygen, that means that there's, uh, whenever you see red color, that red color means that there's oxygen involved, okay? So over here, this is the right atrium and I'm gonna label that a blue color. So that'll be left atrium. Let me do a different color blue. That shows up a little bit better. Okay, left, uh, right atrium, right atrium, okay? Okay, so we got our left atrium here, our right atrium here. And what they do is they collect blood, okay? They're going to collect blood from um, the body or they're gonna collect blood from the lungs, okay? And we'll discuss that. When, once we go through the blood flow, I'll tell you where they're getting the blood from and where they're gonna pump it to. Right now, we just wanna know the chambers and we wanna know the anatomy, okay? So we're gonna do anatomy first and then we'll do physiology once we're done with that. So. This structure is called the left atrium. This structure is called the right atrium, okay? This area down here, below the left atrium, this big space here, that is called the left ventricle. I know it's a little hard to see, so I'll put it down there, okay? So here is our left atrium, and below our left atrium is our left ventricle, okay? Notice that the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart are completely separate from one another, okay? And there's this big piece of muscle here in the heart that's called the septum. And I will put a text box here and I will put septum, oops. Just like in your nose, you, have a, you can have a septum, like a deviated septum, something like that. Okay, that middle piece is called the septum. And what septums do is they separate left and right, right? So your septum in your nose separates your nostrils left and right, okay? Your airways, your different ways for air to go into your nose left and right. If you have a deviated septum, then air doesn't get to one nostril as good as it should. Okay, so that's your septum there. The underneath the right atrium is this big space here and we call that the right ventricle. And we will make that of the same blue color as before. Right ventricle. Okay, and there is our right ventricle. Okay, this whole space. Okay, so those are the four chambers. So the top two chambers collect blood, the bottom two chambers pump blood. Okay, and when I say pump, they're gonna pump blood out of the heart. Okay, so the, the atria, collect blood coming back to the heart and the ventricles pump blood away from the heart, okay? So that's 
that. So we can we can check that off. Okay. Check. Check. Okay. Now let's talk about the valves. Okay. The valves are not hard, they're not complicated, but they have lots of different names and you have to know all the names because when a doctor or a nurse on their chart writes the names of these things, they are allowed to use any of the names that I'm gonna mention and you have to know or be able to identify all of those names so that you know what those uh, professionals are talking about, okay? Or if you are one of those professionals, uh, you're gonna be using that language as well and you're gonna be reading charts as well, okay? so. Let's start off with the atria, the atrioventricular valves, okay? So these are valves that connect atria to the ventricles. Now, if you know anything about valves, there are different types of valves. There are valves that open in both directions. In the human body, in the heart especially, these valves are one-way valves, okay? Which means they only allow blood flow in one direction, okay? We do not want blood going backwards through the heart, okay? There is a flow of blood where it starts one place, goes to another place and then exits. We never want that flow to go backwards, okay? Whatever blood gets pumped out, we need it to stay out. And we need new blood to come in and then get pumped out, new blood to come in and then get pumped out. Okay, we don't want it ever going backwards through that chain, okay? It's the same thing like if you had a, an air pump, okay? Let me, um, let me open up another window. Oh, I can't do that because I'm gonna have to erase all that. Forget that. Okay, I'll, I'll, try, it, uh, I'll try it again another time. If you have a, a pump for a football, okay, or a basketball or a soccer ball, there's a pin that goes into the football and there's a handle that goes up and down to pump the air in and out, right? When you plug that pin into the football and you take that handle and you extend it, there's air going into the tube, into that cylinder. And when you press the handle down, you don't want the air to go out of that same um, valve. You want it to go through another valve, which goes into the football, right? So that if, if you had two-way valves on, a, on an air pump, you would never fill up the ball. You would either be sucking air in and out of the ball, right? Any air that you put into the ball, you would suck immediately out of it. You don't want that. You want all the air that you pump into the ball to stay in the ball, right? So it would be like sucking air through a straw with a hole in it, and you wouldn't want that. Same thing with your heart. You don't want these valves to go in two directions. You only want them in one direction. So both of these atrioventricular valves are going to connect the atria to the ventricle. So you can see them here as these big white, um, like connective tissue looking things here. And that's what they're made of. They're made of connective tissue. They're made of uh, tendons. Okay. So we can put an arrow that tells you the flow of blood here and the flow of blood here, okay? Blood always flows from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart. So this arrow that is showing you blood moves from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And over here, blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle only. You can only have blood flow from those valves in those directions. We, do, we never want blood to go from the left ventricle up to the left atrium or the right ventricle up into the right atrium, okay? If that happens, and it does sometimes, right? It, I'm talking about normal human beings here don't have backflow, but there are some people that have prolapses of valves, right? And most of the time it's in this left ventricle here, this left atrioventricular valve. So, so this valve here is called the, H, the left atrioventricular valve. And this valve here is called the right atrioventricular valve, but they have different names. And that's, that's the only difficult part of this whole thing. So let me write the names here. So this is the left atrioventricular valve, but it can also be called, so left atrioventricular valve, but it can also be called the bicuspid. And it can also be called the mitral valve. Okay, so all three of these names, left atrioventricular valve, the bicuspid valve, or the mitral valve. All of those are terms used for that valve right there. So like I was saying before, sometimes people um, 
have something called a mitral valve prolapse, okay? And a mitral valve prolapse is when this valve doesn't close all the way, okay? So what's supposed to happen is you have two, the reason it's called a bicuspid is because you have things called cusps, C-U-S-P's, cusps. The bicuspid valve has two of these cusps. So they're like, they're little flaps and the flaps open, they allow blood to flow in one direction and then they close. They open, they allow blood to flow in one direction and then they close. And that's basically what these valves do. There are two cusps that open and close in the bicuspid valve. When someone has a bicuspid valve prolapse, one of the cusps goes too far when it retracts. And when that happens, so instead of closing nice and tight, one of them goes back a little too far. Typically that's due to one of these little tendons at the bottom of the heart breaking or being stretched too much. And it doesn't stop the valve where it's supposed to stop and it continues to, to go up. And that creates a space that blood can go backwards from the ventricle into the atria. Okay, and that's called the mitral valve prolapse. Okay, um, the way to fix that is to go have open heart surgery and they have to replace one of these tendons or tighten up one of these tendons so that that valve closes nice and tight again. Okay, what will happen if, if you have a mitral valve prolapse is that blood will get from your ventricle into your atria. Now that atria can only hold a certain volume of blood, right? So if your body thinks that you're going to get the normal volume of blood into that atria every time your heart pumps. So let's just make up a, a number. I don't know what the number is for, you know, the right amount of blood in the atria, but let's just say it's, I don't know, 50 mill, mill, milliliters, okay? So that atria is big enough to hold 50 milliliters of blood every time your heart pumps. So it's going to intake 50 milliliters every pump. But if blood is coming back in up from the bottom of the heart, from the ventricle, as well as coming from where it's collecting from, you're not getting 50 milliliters of blood, you're getting 55 milliliters of blood or 60 milliliters of blood, okay? Your heart adapts to that issue that's going on. So your left atrium, this area, in, in order to accommodate the extra volume of blood will actually increase in size, okay? Now you might think that's not a big deal. That is a big deal. The left atrium, when it gets bigger, it has to work harder and it's not supposed to, right? That's not what it's meant to do. And that's, that's you know, heart disease. That's one thing that, that can be considered heart disease, right? Where your left atrium is expanding, okay? And you don't want that. And that can cause problems. That can cause lots of problems. And it's only gonna get worse as these tendons get worse, okay? So what I was, the whole point of this was that these valves open one direction and that this left semilunar valve, um, this left atrioventricular valve or the bicuspid or the mitral valve, whatever you wanna call it, you can call it all three of these things and you'll be correct every time. They only work in this one direction. On the right-hand side of the heart, okay? This valve is called the, get my text box. This is the right, atrioventricular valve, but it can also be called the tricuspid valve. Okay, you only have two names for this one, which is nice. Okay. And it's made of three cusps instead of two. So there are three flaps instead of two flaps that close. There are three of them. And again, it only flows in this one direction, right atrium to right ventricle. The way that you remember that is that tricuspid has an R in it, and that R means right side of the heart. Okay, so R for right. Tri has an R, R means right side. Okay, let's see if I could, right there. Okay, right side. Now there are two other valves, and they exit the heart. Okay, and we call them semilunar valves. And there's one semilunar valve, right? Let's see if I can. 
right here, right there. And there's another semilunar valve right there. Okay. So the one, let's start off with the one on the left side. And we see the arrow that I drew. And that's not just pointing at the valve, it's also pointing in the direction of the blood flow. Okay. So on the left hand side, we have two names for this. Okay, let me do it at a different color. Okay. We can call this the left semi lunar valve. Okay. LS LV, left semi lunar valve, because it's on the left side of the heart. But we can also call it the aortic valve. Okay. And we call it the aortic valve because this valve opens up into this very large red blood vessel called the aorta. That is the largest blood vessel in the human body. It is going to be the main blood vessel that carries blood to all other peripheral blood vessels. And we actually call this part of the aorta the ascending aorta, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But that's the flow of blood through this portion or this valve. Okay, so this left semilunar valve, when this lower half of the heart, this left ventricle pumps and contracts and squeezes, whatever blood is in here gets pushed through this valve. And again, this valve is only a one-way valve, right? Now this valve is closed when that happens, right? This valve closes, this ventricle squeezes and pushes blood through this left semilunar valve. And it goes behind this big blue thing here. We'll talk about that in a moment pushes the blood through this left semilunar valve into the aorta. And that aorta is gonna carry that blood around the body, okay? On the other side, on the right-hand side, we have the right semilunar valve, right semilunar valve. But it can also be called the pulmonary Valve. Anytime you see the term pulmonary, it refers to the lungs. Okay. And the reason this is called the pulmonary valve is because it's going through this big blue blood vessel that we call the pulmonary artery. Okay. This is the pulmonary. You might be saying to yourself, but it's blue. How could it be an artery? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, it's the pulmonary artery. So just to recap, okay, so those are all four. Those are all four valves. That's those and those. So let's just recap all of this, four chambers and four valves really quick. Okay, so we have left atria at the top, that is connected to the left ventricle with the bicuspid or mitral or left atrioventricular valve. The left ventricle, when it contracts and pumps blood, it pumps blood through this left semilunar or aortic valve, which leads into the aorta. That is the left side of the heart. And all of that blood in that left side of the heart is going to be oxygenated. And you'll notice that we see a lot of red blood vessels attached to that side of the heart because the blood that's going into that side of the heart is oxygenated. And then we look at the right-hand side of the heart and we see the right atrium, which is connected to the right ventricle with the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve, same thing. And when the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood, it pushes blood through this right semilunar valve or the pulmonary valve, which leads into the pulmonary artery. 
and this right side of the heart, you see a lot of blue. And that's because the right side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood. So things are gonna be blue in color. Okay. That's the anatomy of the heart. So now what we wanna do is we wanna talk about the anatomy of these blood vessels that surround the heart. And we talked about some of them already, so it shouldn't be too difficult, okay? So first thing we have to do is we have to talk about arteries and veins. And there's a difference between arteries and veins. And we define arteries and veins not by their colors. We never wanna define an artery or a vein by the color of it, because a lot of times we want to say, this is red, so it's an artery, this is blue, so it's a vein. And in many, many cases, 99.9% .9 of arteries, 99% of arteries will be red in a textbook. 99% of veins will be blue in a textbook. But there is one exception to that rule, and we saw it over here, okay? There's actually two exceptions to that rule. There's one artery that's blue and there's one vein that's red. So we never ever want to define arteries as red or veins as blue. Or we don't want to define them as they carry oxygen or they carry carbon dioxide because we don't. That's not always the case. It's that case in most arteries and veins, but there is an exception. So we, because of that exception, we cannot define arteries and veins like that. The way you define an artery and a vein is that arteries carry blood away from the heart, okay? Arteries are always, let me make it a red arrow. Actually, no, I'm not gonna make it any color arrow. That would be going against what I just said. Arteries carry blood away. Veins carry blood towards the heart, okay? So arteries are always going to go away from the heart. And I'll write that here, arteries away from heart and veins carry blood towards the heart. So that's how you define veins and arteries. It's the direction in which blood is flowing through them, not necessarily the contents of the blood that are in them. Okay. So with that said, Let's look at the anatomy of these blood vessels. So we see a whole bunch of blood vessels and all of these blood vessels are directly connected to the heart, okay? So we already mentioned this big one, the aorta. That's an artery, okay? And notice the arrow. The arrow is going away from the heart, right? The arrow is pointing away from the structure of the heart. So we call that an artery. And that's a special artery because it's the biggest one and it's called the aorta. Next lecture, next Saturday, we're gonna learn about what all of these things that are coming off of the aorta are, but right now we just wanna know that this is the aorta. And we actually call this the ascending aorta because it's going up towards your head. But if you looked at the back of the heart, if you turn the heart around, I wish I had a model here, but I don't. But if you turn the heart around, you would see that this aorta curves downward. Okay, it goes up from the top of the heart, and then it makes a right-hand turn and goes down. And it goes down behind the heart. So all the way behind the heart, if we turn the heart around, we would see the aorta going down, 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 and come out here. Okay, we see it again here. This is called the descending aorta. And I'm gonna have an arrow here. And blood, again, look at the arrow, look at the direction of that arrow we see that arrow is going down away from the heart. So this is an artery. So this we call the descending aorta. Okay, that's what we call the descending aorta. Okay, so we have the ascending aorta here and we have the descending aorta here. It's all one piece, okay? So it's like one big pipe that has a big hook in it and then it goes down and it's gonna go down and it's going to go all the way to your pelvis and then split when it gets to your pelvis and go down your legs. And we have different names for all the different splits that it has and all that kind of stuff. But right now we just wanna call it the aorta, okay? And I'll show you 
uh, different pictures of this in a little bit. Then we see this big blue blood vessel here and this big blue blood vessel here underneath the heart, okay? So let me get my arrows again. This is called the superior vena cava. Let me get this out here, okay? So I'm gonna put a text box. This is the superior, I'm just gonna put an S, vena cava. That is the largest vein in the human body. And notice the arrow where I drew the arrow. That arrow was going down towards the heart. That arrow is pointing at the structure of the heart. We call it superior because it's above, right? Remember your, your vocabulary, superior means above. And if we ever name something superior, that means there has to be an opposite or else we wouldn't have named it that, okay? And that's, whoops, I wanna get rid of that. Hold on, undo that. Okay, this is the inferior vena cava over here. Okay, so I'm just gonna make this a blue color so you can see it differently from the other ones. So this is the inferior, I'm gonna make capital I, inferior vena cava. And that's right there. Okay. And that is going to bring blood, the superior one at least, will bring blood back to your heart from your head, neck, shoulders, and arms. Anything that's above the heart, any of the blood that is coming back to the heart from above the heart. So any blood that is returning to the heart from your head, from your neck, from your arms and shoulders and your upper uh, torso, all of that blood has to go back to your heart eventually to get more oxygen through your superior vena cava and any blood below your heart. So any blood in your abdomen, any blood in your legs, feet, toes is gonna go back to your heart up through this inferior vena cava. And both of those attach to your right atrium, okay? It looks like the inferior vena cava kind of plugs into the bottom of the ventricle here. It doesn't. It, if you look at the back of the heart, the inferior vena cava goes up and attaches here in the right atrium. Okay, so if I was to, you know, just draw a, you know, a little circle, this would be the opening for that vena cava, for the inferior vena cava, and the opening for the superior vena cava would be up here. So both of those empty or spill into the right atrium, okay? So those are the two major veins, um, two major um, veins and arteries. That's the major artery of the, of the human body. This is the major vein of the human body, okay? This brings blood to the rest of the body. This brings blood back to the heart, okay? Now we have to talk about these guys on the sides. Okay, we see these two red ones on this side. We see the two red ones on that side. We see this big blue one here, and we see this big blue one here. Let's start off with the one we already know, which is the pulmonary artery, okay? The pulmonary artery takes blood from the right ventricle and gives it back to the lungs, okay? You gotta remember, there's a big lung here, okay? And I'll, once we go through the blood flow, I'm gonna have to erase all of this stuff, and we'll, we'll talk about blood flow, but there's a big lung over here, and there's a big lung over here. And these two red ones and this blue one are gonna to attach to that lung directly. And this blue one on this side and these two red ones on this side are gonna to attach to this lung directly. And that's the whole point of this, right? Let's not forget the entire purpose of the circulatory system. The purpose of the circulatory system is to bring oxygen from the lungs into and infuse it, the, the oxygen infuses onto your blood in your lungs. And then that blood has to get pushed around your body or pumped around your body through your heart and your circulatory system. That oxygen goes to every cell in your body, it goes to your head, goes to your fingertips and arms and everywhere in between your toes, your legs, your abdomen, all the organs in between. And then it uses that oxygen. And then all that blood that has all the oxygen taken off of it in all of your tissues 
has to return back to your lungs to get more oxygen to go back and do it all over again. That's the whole point. Think of it like a taxi cab, right? Think of a red blood cell as a taxi cab. It picks people up in your lungs. It goes to your heart. Your heart sends it to where it has to go. And then it drops that, that person off where it needs to be. So let's say your brain needs oxygen and the oxygen is a passenger, right? Your, your taxi goes to the, um, to the airport, let's say the airport, not the airport, it's the lungs, picks up a passenger, drives that passenger through the heart, gets on the highway, which is the heart and the circulatory system, drives it to the brain where it, that passenger lives, that's the destination, drops that passenger off, and now you have an empty taxi cab, right? Once that taxi cab drops off their passenger at their destination, what does that taxi do? That taxi goes back to get more passengers, right? So that empty taxi has to go back to the heart and then back to the lungs, pick up another passenger and drive that, pass that new passenger somewhere else. So that's what the heart is. The heart is the middleman to get between uh, destinations around the body and the, you know, the place where the passengers are, which is the airport, which is the lungs. Right? So that taxi cab has to constantly go back and forth from lungs to heart to a destination, from destination to heart to lungs. Okay, back and forth, back and forth constantly. That's all these little red blood cells do. Okay, now this big blue blood vessel that's going away from the heart, even though it's blue, it's going away from the heart because it does not have any oxygen in it. That's called the pulmonary lung, right? Pulmonary means lung artery right? Remember artery away from the heart, pulmonary lungs. So this blood vessel takes oxygen, poor blood or oxygen, um, blood vessels, the blood cells that do not have oxygen brings them towards or into the lungs, which is away from the heart. That's why we call it an artery. All arteries go away from the heart, but this is the only artery in the body that's colored blue. It's the only artery in the body that handles blood that does not have oxygen. And that goes right to the lungs. And it, go, it, it actually splits and it goes in two directions, okay? It goes left to the left pulmonary branch of the pulmonary artery. And it also goes right and through here, okay? So this pulmonary artery branches off to the left lung here and to the right lung here. Okay, that it, it's kind of like, you know, um, weaved through the aorta there. Okay, it's a beautiful thing how all this is put together. It really is. Okay, and it leaves and goes through to the right lung on this side. So this is the right pulmonary artery as well. This is the left pulmonary artery. Okay. These two red guys here, these two red guys here and these two red guys here, these are bringing blood, nice oxygen rich blood from the lungs into the left atrium. I'm gonna draw an arrow all the way across here and all the way across here because it's very easy to see these blood vessels here attaching to the left atrium. And these are called your pulmonary veins. I'm gonna make them red because they're colored red. Okay, Pul pulmonary veins. I'm just gonna abbreviate pulmonary, pulmonary veins. Okay, and these are your left pulmonary veins. Okay, and over here you have your right pulmonary veins. And both of these sets of pulmonary veins, left and right pulmonary veins, they all take oxygen rich blood from your lungs and they bring it to the left atrium. Now it seems like over here, they would attach to the right atrium, but they're not. They go all the way across the back of your heart. Okay, they don't go through the, they don't go through the atrium and all this middle stuff. They actually run along the back side of your heart and they pull over in the right atrium. So you can see here, here's where the left pulmonary veins attach or dump the blood into the left atrium. But over here, like hidden in this little crevice, you're gonna have two more openings 
for the right pulmonary veins that come from the right side of the heart or the right lung, right? These are coming from the left lung. These are coming from the right lung. Let me see, I got a question in the chat. Oh boy, let's see, whoops. Undo, 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 hold on, undo. There we go. And now I gotta move this thing out of here so I can read it. Okay. What causes the bicuspid flaps not to close tight, just like you mentioned earlier? Uh, that could be some type of genetic issue or that could just be over time, the tendons here uh, get weakened. And if over time those tendons get weak and they get stretched out, it's like if you have a rope, um, you know, if you have a rope for 10, 15 years, that rope can get stretched out and lose its, um, lose its tightness. And just over time, those tendons can get stretched out. It doesn't usually happen to people. It's very rare that it happens to people. Um, and that could be due to some type of chemical that's in the body. It could be due to a medication that you've taken, or it could just be your genetics in general. What causes heartburn? Okay, that actually has nothing to do with the heart. That actually deals with uh, your esophagus and your stomach. So down in this area, like right below your heart, behind your heart, you have your esophagus, which is where your food goes, right? So your food goes down behind your heart in your thoracic cavity. So like, here's my mug. If this was my heart, you know, my esophagus, and my trachea is behind it like this. And right below, right below my diaphragm, like in this area, if this was my heart again, if this was my stomach, my esophagus is connecting from my mouth. I don't know if you guys can even see this. Okay. My esophagus, which is the pen, is connecting from my mouth, which is going up through here to my stomach, which is the post-it note. Okay, if my stomach is full of acid and sometimes that acid gets into my esophagus and if the acid gets into my esophagus, it burns my esophagus. But since my esophagus is so close to my heart, it feels like it's burning my heart, but it's not actually burning my heart. It's just the burning sensation is in the area of my heart. So we call it heartburn. So it's not really burning your heart. It's just, it's a burning sensation due to stomach acid in your esophagus. Good question though. Okay, so back to this. So you have right pulmonary veins here. You have left pulmonary veins here. They're both attached to a lung. Notice they're veins because they're bringing blood towards the heart. Look at the arrows. The arrows are pointing towards the heart, towards the heart, towards the heart, towards the heart. So we call them veins but they're red. This is the only red blood vessel, uh, only red vein that you have in the entire human body. And they're called veins because their blood flow is going to the heart, but they're red because they're carrying oxygenated blood. Okay. I'll take a quick sip of this. So that is, oh, look at this, I can put little stamps. Huh, how do you like that? learn something new. So we did the blood vessels, did the arteries, did aorta, vena cava, pulmonary veins, pulmonary arteries. Boom. Oh, I like this little thing. It's my new favorite toy. Okay. We did the valves, we did the ventricles. We're going to double check everything here. Okay. So now I have to erase all this. Now I'm recording this. So you'll have, um, you'll have this video if you need it. I'm going to post it to a YouTube channel that I have and you can see it. Um, but I have to erase this. So if you need to take a picture of it, you got 10 seconds to take a picture of this crazy screen if you need to. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so I have to clear all this. <clears throat> now we're gonna talk about blood flow through the heart. I actually only wanna get rid of this stuff, but I don't think I can, that's okay. So we wanna talk about blood flow now. So we're gonna talk about blood flow in terms of left side of the heart and in terms of right side of the heart. And once we're done with blood flow, I'm gonna show you a little video and then we'll be done with the, the lecture for today and then I'll give you work to do, okay? So I, it doesn't matter where you start because it's a cycle. 
it doesn't matter if you start on the right side, or if you start on the left side, it doesn't really matter. I personally like to start on the left side, but it doesn't matter for you, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write three steps for the left side. I'm gonna write three steps for the right side. And that should be good enough for what you're gonna do. So step number one, and we're gonna do this in red and blue colors. So step number one is going to be that oxygen rich blood from the lungs collects, actually let's say from the lungs passes, you know, you know, collects in the left atrium through the right and left pulmonary veins. That is step number one. So once again, here's my arrows. And you know what, let's, let's draw a lung. How about that? We're gonna draw a lung. So there's gonna be a lung here. Let's see, hold on, let's make it a different color. Let's make it brown. Yeah, let's go, brown. you know what, let's go like maroon. We don't want brown lungs. We're not smokers. Maybe some of us are, but I'm not. Okay, we have a lung here and we have a lung here. Okay, so those are our lungs. So oxygen rich blood from the lungs. Okay, so we'll do oxygen, we'll write oxygen here, O2. Oxygen rich blood from the lungs, and we'll do another one over here, O2. And then we're gonna draw our arrows. There. There, there, there. And then we're gonna fill up, we're gonna fill up this atrium with blood, okay? Okay, so oxygen rich blood from the lungs collects in the left atrium through the right and left pulmonary veins. So this is a collection of blood, this big red circle that has come from the left pulmonary vein here and the right pulmonary vein here, which got these, which got this oxygen rich blood from these two lungs. Okay, everyone follow me so far, I hope. Okay, step number two. The bicuspid valve, again, you can call it the mitral valve or the left atrioventricular valve opens and oxygen rich blood from the left atrium moves into the left ventricle. So this bicuspid valve is going to open and the blood that was in the left atrium is going to move from the left atrium. Let's see if I can erase it. Oh, I can erase it, good. That's gonna move from there to here. Okay, so the blood that was up here now moves down into the left atrium, the left ventricle, sorry, okay. Step three, the bicuspid valve closes in the left ventricle contracts and pumps blood oxygen rich blood through the aortic valve 
to the aorta and throughout the body. So this left ventricle contracts and all of this oxygen rich blood goes through the aortic valve into the aorta and then out to the rest of the body through the aorta. And all of that nice oxygen is gonna get into all of your cells, right? So let's draw a cell down here. And that cell is gonna be red because it's carrying oxygen. There's our, let's put it over here. There's our nice oxygen rich cell. And that oxygen rich cell is gonna go to all of the cells in the body or go to a cell in the body. And it's gonna give up that oxygen to the cell. Okay. That is the flow of blood through the left side of the heart. Now, the flow of blood through the, I'm sorry, that is the, yeah, this is the flow of blood through the left side. Now, when this cell gives up its oxygen, it's, it's not red anymore. The reason that blood cells are red is because oxygen and hemoglobin, when they connect, they cause this red color. When you take oxygen away from hemoglobin, it turns blue. And that's why your veins have this bluish green color on your hands and on your arms and everything else. You see your veins, you don't see your arteries because the veins are more superficial. The veins are closer to the surface, okay? Your arteries are much deeper inside of you, so you don't see them, okay? So when this cell, let's just make believe this cell is going to your uh, quads, which is your, the big muscles in your thighs. So when that cell, you're running, right? You're, you're, you're running, you're playing basketball, you're swimming, you're walking, it doesn't matter, whatever you're doing. This oxygen needs to get to the muscles in your thigh so that your thigh can go through cellular respiration and produce ATP. That's what oxygen is for. That's why we breathe, right? We breathe so that we can give the oxygen to our muscles and that, that muscle can use the oxygen to make cellular energy called ATP. That red blood cell is a taxi, remember, and the oxygen is its passenger. Well, eventually, once that taxi gets to its destination, it's going to give up its passenger. Its passenger is gonna leave. And when that passenger leaves, it turns the taxi, just like the taxi has that sign at the top of the taxi that says, uh, you know, uh, vacant or, or, or full, whatever it is, whatever the sign says, your blood cell will turn from red, oops, let's undo that. Your blood cell will turn from red to blue from when it has oxygen and when it doesn't have oxygen. And also your body is very good at getting rid of waste and the waste product of cellular respiration making that cellular energy is called carbon dioxide. So instead of just giving up the oxygen, it will give up the oxygen, but it'll also take with it this waste product called carbon dioxide. Now that waste product, there's only one way to get that waste product out and that's to exhale it out through your mouth and your mouth is connected to your lungs. So that CO2 that's on this taxi cab has to go back to the heart and the heart has to pump it back to the lungs so that it can get exhaled through your mouth. And then once it's exhaled, it can then pick up another oxygen and do this whole thing over again. So the CO2 here in this cell from your thigh, remember it's this, this cell, these two cells are the same cells. It's the same taxi cab, right? This taxi cab had oxygen in it and it was red. And then it gave up the oxygen and got carbon dioxide and it turned the taxi cab blue. Same cell, okay? This CO2, this uh, oxygen, so we're gonna call that oxygen poor blood, okay? This oxygen poor blood has to get back to the heart so that it can go back to the lungs to get more oxygen. So that's gonna lead me to step number one. And step number one of pulmonary circulation, remember this is pulmonary, let's, uh, let's, let's label that. So this was, cardiac circulation. We're going to do 
pulmonary circulation on this side. So this is pulmonary circulation. Okay. Step number one of pulmonary circulation is oxygen poor blood returns to the heart through the superior and inferior vena cava and collect in the right atrium. Okay, so any blood that's coming back to the heart from your abdomen, legs, and feet, they're gonna come up through the inferior vena cava. And any blood coming back to the heart from your head, neck, shoulders, and arms is gonna come back to the heart through the superior vena cava. And they're both going to collect in the right atrium. Okay. Step two is just like step two on the other side. Okay, the tricuspid valve opens and oxygen poor blood moves from the right atrium into the right ventricle. So this blood is going to move into the left ventricle, uh, right ventricle, because this tricuspid valve is going to open, just like on the other side. I'm actually going to leave those circles there. Okay, so we can see the flow of those circles. Okay, step number three is gonna be just like step number three on the other side, except it's on the right-hand side. So the tricuspid valve closes, the left, uh, the right ventricle contracts, pumping blood, uh, oxygen poor blood. pulmonary artery into the lungs. Okay, so we'll get another arrow. Okay, so this um, tricuspid valve will close. This left ventricle down here will contract and push blood, whoops, I don't want a red arrow, I want a blue arrow, and we'll push blood through the right semilunar valve, which is what that is, into the, or the pulmonary valve, into the pulmonary artery, back into the lungs. So our cell, our little blue cell has made its way back here and it has to give up its carbon dioxide it has to give up its carbon dioxide so that you can exhale it same thing over here And then that little blue cell turns red again. Once it gives up its CO2 because it takes oxygen. Okay, and we're just gonna draw some arrows here that show you that CO2 is leaving. Let's make this a black arrow. Okay, I'll show you that this is CO2 leaves through you exhaling. 
and oxygen is comes in from you inhaling. And this whole process starts over again. So you, again, you, you'll have uh, 10 seconds to take a picture of the screen if you want to. And then I'm gonna show you a movie about how this, not a movie, but a little YouTube clip about how this works. Okay, because I have to erase all this. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Okay, so I have to clear this. Now let me just stop sharing for a moment so I can get the video up for you. Okay, give me one second. Let me find the right video. Because there's one video in particular that I like. Here it is. Okay. Now let me share my screen with you again. Okay. All right, someone tell me if they could see the video because I know sometimes when you hit full screen, it doesn't take it, it takes it away. Someone put in the chat if you could see the video. Okay, good. All right, so now this video is kind of old but it does the trick and it's very short. Okay, so let's just watch this video real quick. I'm gonna pause it here and there so that you can, um, so that I can mention it or say some things. Okay, so here we go. Heart is a pump. It's a muscular. Your heart is a pump. It's a muscular organ about the size of your fist and is located slightly left of center in your chest. Your heart is divided into the right and left side the division protects oxygen rich blood from mixing with oxygen poor blood. Together, your heart and blood vessels comprise your cardiovascular system, which circulates blood and oxygen. Okay, one thing I want to mention that I always forget to mention until I watch the video is that let me just go backwards a little bit. Okay, this system is called a closed system. Okay, your circulatory system is a closed system, which means that blood is not just flowing out of your arteries and veins into your tissues. All the blood stays in these blood vessels. And when it wants to leave, it diffuses through the walls of your blood, of your uh, blood vessels. Okay, there are some organisms that there's just an end to an artery and that all that blood just pours into the surrounding tissues of that, of that organism. We are not like that. Our entire circulatory system is closed. The only openings that you have really are in the heart, but the only those openings open to these blood vessels. Okay. So everything has to diffuse through the walls of these different um, blood vessels. So there has to be a connection somewhere where arteries become veins and where veins become arteries. And we see it here in the thumb of this, you know, model. And where that happens, that connection, where that happens, circulates. this is called a capillary. Okay. So just make sure that you know that this is a capillary. Okay. Where veins and arteries merge to become one blood vessel, that's called a capillary. Okay. Blood and oxygen around your body. In fact, your heart pumps about five quarts of blood every minute, and it beats about 100,000 times in one day. That's about 35 million times in a year. Oxygen poor blood, blue blood. Okay, so this is what we were going through before. <clears throat> you could see that oxygen poor, like they're starting on the right hand side, I start on the left, it doesn't matter. Okay, so all of this blood is going back to the heart. It's coming from the arms. It's coming from the head and neck up here, from this arm. And, every, and all of these things are above the heart. So they're coming back to the heart through the superior vena cava here. And all the blood from your lower half, your abdomen, legs, feet, pelvis, all that stuff, reproductive organs, all that blood is coming back up through to the heart to the, uh, from the inferior vena cava, which is all gonna collect here 
in the right atrium. Turns to the heart after circulating through your body. The right side of the heart, composed of the right atrium and ventricle, collects and pumps the blood to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. The lungs refresh the blood with a new supply of oxygen, making it turn red. Oxygen-rich blood, red blood, then enters the left side of the heart, composed of the left atrium. Okay, notice it came back from the lungs. It's, the lungs are connected in two different parts. This connection was for deoxygenated blood. This connection is for oxygenated blood. They both collect in the left atrium. Atrium and ventricle, and is pumped through the aorta to the- Okay, here's the aorta, the ascending aorta. Here's the descending aorta. And that's gonna bring blood throughout the rest of your body. And this is a constant cycle. The body to supply tissues with oxygen. Four valves within your heart keep your blood moving the right way. The tricuspid, mitral, pulmonary, and aortic valves work like gates on a fence. They open only one way and only when pushed on. Okay, notice when the atrioventricular valves are open, the semilunar valves are closed, right? So when your mitral bicuspid valve and your tricuspid valve are opened, the aortic and pulmonary valves are closed. This is so that we can build up pressure, okay? We need to have blood pressure in order to get that blood away into your limbs, okay? If you didn't have any pressure, the blood wouldn't move, right? Same thing like in a, in a car, if you don't have pressure in your, in your engine or in, a, in your pipes, if you don't have pressure in your pipes, the, the water doesn't move around, the things don't move. So we need to have pressure. So some of these valves need to be closed while the other ones are open and vice versa. If we, if I just hit play real quick, each when the semilunar valves are open, the AV valves are closed. Okay. So I'm just going to re, I'm just going to go backwards a little bit so that you can hear what he says. They open only one way and only when pushed on. Each valve opens and closes once per heartbeat or about once every second. A beating heart contracts and relaxes. Contraction is called systole. Okay, so that is, that was it for um, the flow of blood through the heart. The, the remaining part of this video is gonna be talking about blood pressure. Okay, and you've all, you all know, you all heard the term blood pressure. You might not know what it means, um, but you know what blood pressure is. And your typical blood pressure they give you numbers, right? They, they, they hook up this thing to your arm. They pump it up like a balloon. There's a little uh, machine that pumps, that gives you some type of reading. And that reading for someone who's healthy should be somewhere between 120 over 80, right? And you know that that's the good number. You know that one, it should be 120 over 80. If you see like 135 over 88, you have, your blood pressure is a little high. If you see a number like 150 over 90, that's really high blood pressure, okay? If you see something in the 170s over, you know, 100, you might have to go to the hospital, okay? And the same thing for, these would be high blood pressures. And the same thing for low blood pressures, right? If you see something like 110 over 75, it's okay, you have low, your blood pressure is lower than normal, but it's not necessarily, you know, you're not in danger necessarily, or, or if it's 115, you're not necessarily in danger of something, right? But then once you hit like, if your blood pressure starts to get to like 100 over, you know, 70 or 100 over 60, 68, something might be wrong, okay? So what does this 120 over 80 mean? This 120 is the pressure of the bottom of your heart, the ventricles of your heart, and the 80 is the amount of pressure for the atria of your heart, okay? The bottom of your heart is always gonna be the high number, okay? The 120 is always gonna be the ventricles. The high number is always gonna talk about the ventricles because that's where the most force is. is. When your heart pumps, there's a lot of force that is generated from the bottom of your heart to push blood away from you, away from the heart, right? And that force 
requires lots of pressure. So the bottom of your heart, those ventricles, that push, that contraction is going to be the high number all the time. Whatever that high number is, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, those high numbers, the top numbers on that um, fraction are always gonna be the amount of pressure being generated by the ventricles of your heart. The 80 or in the 120 over 80 is going to be the pressure of the atria. And it's not even the pressure, it's the relaxation of the atria, right? When you're, the top of your heart doesn't contract, it just relaxes, okay? It fills up with blood and then it relaxes. It fills up with blood and then relaxes. When it relaxes, blood is pouring out of it. Blood's not being pumped out of it. Blood is pouring out of it or dripping out of it, so to speak, okay? Actually, in, in, actually in, in, in reality, it's actually being sucked out of it, right? The ventricles actually suck the blood from the top of the heart because there, if you've ever had like a dropper or a, like a turkey baster, when you squeeze the, the bulb, okay, you're forcing air out. And then when you dip that into liquid and you release the bulb, you're sucking liquid in, right? So that's what's happening. When you squeeze the bulb, it's, it's on the bottom pointing up, like the ventricle pointing up. When you squeeze that bulb, when you squeeze that ventricle, you're pushing the blood out. And then when you release the bulb, it's sucking the blood from the top of the heart, okay? So the, the bottom number is gonna be that atria when it relaxes and the blood gets sucked out of it, okay? It doesn't require as much pressure, so that number is gonna be lower, right? When the heart pumps and that bulb gets pushed and the blood gets thrown out of the heart, that's gonna be high pressure. And then when you release, when you relax that ventricle, it's gonna suck the blood in from the top of the heart. That's gonna be your lower number on the bottom. We have names for that, okay? Systole is the pressure at the bottom and diastole is pressure on the top. So we call the pressure, the high number, systolic blood pressure, that 120, 130, 140, that's systolic blood pressure. And that bottom number, 80, 70, 60, is the diastolic blood pressure from the atria of the heart. Okay, so I'm just gonna rewind a, a tad so that you can hear him in his full lecture here. Or about once every second. A beating heart contracts and relaxes. Contraction is called systole and relaxing is called diastole. During systole, your ventricles contract, forcing blood into the vessels going to your lungs and body, much like ketchup being forced out of a squeeze bottle. The right ventricle contracts a little bit before the left ventricle does. Your ventricles then relax during diastole and are filled with blood coming from the upper chambers, the left and right atria. Then the cycle starts over again. Your heart is nourished by blood too, blood vessels called- Okay, this is something I didn't mention before either. Okay, the reason we do this, and I mentioned this, but I didn't mention the other part. You're, the reason we have a heart and we pump blood around is so that cells can get oxygen. But we never think about the heart itself. The heart is tissue, just like your muscles are tissue and your bones are tissue and everything else. So your heart needs blood supply as well. Your heart has tissue and they need oxygen as well. So you have these, vessels on the outside of the heart, which are called your coronary arteries. Okay, these are coronary arteries. And these coronary arteries and coronary veins are going to be the uh, blood vessels that supply the heart itself with oxygen. Because if you deplete the heart of oxygen, the same thing happens to your heart that will happen to any tissue that gets depleted of oxygen. The cells will die. If you deplete your brain of oxygen, your brain dies. If you deplete your muscles of oxygen, they produce lactic acid and then they could possibly die themselves. If you deplete your heart of oxygen, the heart tissue dies and you can have what you call a heart attack. Okay, and that would not be a good thing. You've all heard of um, bypass surgery. I, I would think you've heard of bypass surgery. People have to get coronary bypasses, okay? And what that means, what a coronary bypass means is that there's a clog in one of these coronary veins and arteries, okay? So let's just put a little black circle here and say that's a clog in an artery. 
okay? Someone had a heart attack, they go to the hospital, they do MRIs and CAT scans and all that type of stuff, and they find a clog right there in this person's coronary artery. What they have to do is do something called a bypass. This blood vessel is way too thin to do what they call an angioplasty, okay? An angioplasty would be done on one of these large blood vessels here. So let's, let's say there's a blockage here in this blood vessel here, okay? What they'll do for that clog is they will insert something called, hold on, let me get this out here. They'll insert this thin wire into the person's artery. And on that wire will be a balloon, a deflated balloon. And once they get that wire into the person's artery where it's clogged, they pump the balloon up. And when they pump the balloon up, actually, let me get a different um, shape here. I want an oval. Actually, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Once they pump that balloon up, it will move the plaque around. Okay. This is plaque. This clog is plaque. It's like a, it's like a white kind of like mayonnaise-y looking substance. And that's what's causing the clog. So what they do is they blow this balloon up. Let's see if I can maybe draw it with uh, something like this. Okay, they blow up the balloon and that will dissipate the clog. Okay, the clog itself will move around and create an opening. They're not actually removing the plaque. They're just moving it around so that it there's a hole in the middle so that blood can flow through. It's kind of like a pipe, right? If you have a pipe, it's clogged. You want to get rid of the clog. Um, what we do with a clogged pipe is we remove the clog. You can't do that in an artery because you can break the artery. So what they do is they just, they take this clog and they, they put a balloon in there and they, they pump it up and they, they move around the plaque so that it's opened instead of closed, right? They just open it up. They can't do that here because these um, coronary arteries are way too small and they'll just break them, okay? They'll break them. So what they do is they take artery from another part of you. Uh, a lot of times they'll take arteries in your legs uh, and they'll take a little tiny little piece of an artery and they'll reconnect it all in your legs so that you're not bleeding and stuff like that internally. And they'll come over here and they will attach the new artery here and then they'll attach it again after the clog. And what they've done is they have bypassed the clog just like a bypass on a road, right? You ever get to a road and it says detour and you have to go around and then a mile later, you end up back on that same road again, but you had to go around the problem, right? There was construction or there was an accident and you went around this detour and ended up back on that same road you started, but you had to go around the problem. And that's what they do here. They take another artery from another part of your body and they attach it before the clog and they bring it down and attach it after the clog so that the blood that could not go this way now goes around and goes back down this way, okay? If they do this in one spot on the heart, that's called a coronary bypass. If they do this on two portions of the heart, that's called a double bypass. If they do it on three portions of the heart, that's called a triple bypass. If they do it on four portions of the heart, it's called a quadruple bypass, okay? So that's why you have all those different types of bypasses. We got a question in the chat. Isn't that called heart cath? Like, um, I don't know what that means. Not sure what a cat, do you mean catheter? A catheter is something a little bit different. It's called an angioplasty. Okay, it's what it, the, the, the procedure is called an angioplasty, what this is. Okay. All right, let me um, continue to play this video for you. Get all this stuff out of here. Okay. Called coronary arteries extend over the surface of your heart and branch into smaller capillaries. Here you can see just the network of blood vessels that feed your heart with oxygen rich blood. Your heart also has electrical wiring, which okay. we're not going to get into the electrical wiring today with this. 
Let me stop sharing real quick. Going back to this. Okay, so that is going to do it for the lecture today. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back to D2L and I'm going to assign you um, some questions to do. And you'll have to do those by next week. So don't go anywhere yet. I just wanna make sure that you guys can see everything before you leave and that we're all good on my end and your end. So hold on one second. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna add assignment. We're gonna go to question bank. Okay, this is going to be due February 6th by 9 a.m. Okay, so if you guys can go on to D2L, there should be an assignment called chapter 19 questions. If someone can give me a heads uh, thumbs up on that, that would be great. Um, I can show, I can give you the link, got it, okay, good. Okay, so that's there. That is due by next Saturday at nine o'clock. Okay, that'll be due next Saturday by the start of class. So you have all week to do that. There's 25 questions there. I didn't kill you too much. Um, if you guys hold on one second, if you want to see where I post these videos, um, I will let you see that in one minute. So let me think. I, do, do, do. Okay, so let me see here. So if you go to YouTube and you just type in Steven Ionicelli, um, that should be where you find my videos. So there, there are a whole bunch of videos here. I teach um, 
biology as well. So there, there might be, there's lots of videos that you um, wouldn't use. So here was last week's video. So it says anatomy and physiology, blood, comp uh, blood components and blood typing. So that was our, that was our lecture from last week. Um, this is where I'm going to put all of the uh, videos that I do from our lectures. So later on today, or even tomorrow, when I get the recording of this, I will upload it here. So that, that you should have access to that um, by Monday, if not by Tuesday, for sure. Okie doke. All right, so I will um, see you guys next week. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me. All right, have a good week, everybody.